All right, welcome to uh, speed presentation. I believe this is number five um, that we've done now um, over the, or actually number seven, sorry. This is uh, presentation number seven. And we have been, um, been doing these now for seven weeks. It's kind of crazy when you, when you think about it that we've already done that many of them already. Uh, we've got a, a new picture here uh, up on the screen of, um, of the car. Obviously uh, every week uh, we get farther along with the design process. Uh, we've got it sitting here with exhaust, turbos, fans, uh, bottomed out on tires, uh, kind of shows the ground clearance under the car. Uh, this is sitting on a 32.5 inch tall tire right here. Uh, that's what we're, we're specking it for is a 32.5. And the guys are working on getting the Instagram camera set. So um, if I need to, to do something for a few minutes, I can do that until we get set. Okay, keep going. All right, um, so um, four-seater, um, looks like it's missing axles, but most of the cars come along. As you see, we've, we've really focused on the rear bed area. We've got the, the detail of the bed really coming together. Uh, I got a little more work to do here on the number plate, um, but all in all the cars together. I'll start off like we do every week. Uh, questions from last week and um, I'll turn to the screen here. John asks, uh, will there be one, more than one spring rate um, for each car to choose from? And will the steering links be 7075 like our XX upgrades on the Articat XX factory? And my answer is, um, when we build a manufacturable car like we're doing today, uh, that we have to build a car that works for all types of terrain all types of driving styles and a variety of, uh, of loads in the vehicle. I'm talking one person, two people, or four people when we're talking about the four-seater. We've got to really find a good happy medium with all the suspension. So we will get uh, the best package that we can put together. And with that said, um, once that's done and then you decide that you want to put four 300-pound guys in it, you're gonna to have to pop over to speed side by side and you're probably gonna to have to adjust your spring rates. Or you can go to your local shock tuning guy, whatever your favorite is in the industry, and ask him, hey, you know, what do you think I should do? Because normally I ride with three 300 pound guys. All right. Um, all right. Sorry, a little adjustment here. Sorry about that. So uh, the other thing is tie rods. Yes, the tie rods will be 75, 75. They will be straight, they will be square. And uh, why don't we just put that back where it was and we'll just go like we've been the last few weeks. Um, and one thing uh, I do wanna talk about is um, why narrower suspension is not gonna work on our, um, our, our out of the box cars and what I mean by out of the box the um, the cars that we launched in September uh, the four-seater that we're building um, here um, on the screen um, we designed this car to optimize uh, the most uh, radiator uh, in the front if we chose to do that for the enclosed cab car and with that I'll scroll around here a little bit and find a, a front uh, front view and here's a picture of the car bottomed out in the front and we've got to steer these tires and clear the headlights so each car in width will get a different headlight configuration it'll be probably split right down the middle where the headlights will be the same the bottom light bar will change and this will change a bit in here uh, we'll probably lose our, our NACA duck for like a 70 or 72 inch wide car. But we've got to move that, we've got to shift that in to be able to clear. When we were designing the car and what we've seen for most of our sales, the 77 width has been spot on. Um, we're over 640 uh, four seaters, um, sold over 766 cars on pre-order. And um, we've optimized a lot of the package. So uh, a lot bigger. Um, front headlight span, much bigger grill opening for 
2021 summer models come with enclosed cab that will allow us to, uh, to have a bigger radiator up front with a bigger AC condenser in the front. Huh? Mic's bad? You want to unplug it and try plugging it back in? Hmm. Same mic we've been using the last few weeks. I don't know what's going on there. Any better? All right. Um, well, I'll stick with this for a few more minutes, and then uh, and then we'll take it off if it's not any better. Sorry about that, guys. So hopefully we've asked answered the question there um, with regards to um, the four seater. I'm gonna go into the or to the 72 and 70 inch wide cars. Uh, over here, I've got uh, Arian uh, asked a question. I purchased a four seater. My biggest concern is owning a car with no local dealer infrastructure. I'm giving my answer away already. Um, any warranty work recalls, bug fixes aren't going to happen without local service center. Is there anything you can tell us uh, about teasers to put in our minds to ease? And same question, David Silverstein, Silverman came below and he asked, um, wondering about supports. So what I did is the first thing I wanted to check and see if, um, if Arian actually ordered a car, he did. He's number uh, 742 uh, is his number of vehicle. Uh, I've seen that he is located in Nevada and we have ATC, ATV Cycle Sports Pike over there. He'll, um, he'll be supporting our speed UTVs as well. So to answer your question, uh, we will have dealers in a lot of the Western states. Uh, that's where we're focusing on our sales. And this is where I believe our car is gonna rock the industry. Um, Nicholas Olson from Chupacabra Off-Road uh, asked a question about motion ratio um, and he's talking about shock geometry and motion ratio so what I did is I actually had to walk out it's been a while since I've thought about the motion ratio on the trophy truck because we've been so focused on building these new speed UTV cars uh, he says uh, today's video is about suspension I'd like to hear about shock stroke as it relates to performance um, my thought is the longer stroke shocks on the X3 rear are an advantage. Curious why you guys didn't go with a longer stroke on the rear shock, even though the interchangeable aspect is cool. I have a second question from Doris. I'm no expert, but I've always uh, wondered the opposite. Long stroke seems wasteful and lazy to get travel numbers. Um, both of you guys are actually right. It's, it's kind of weird, but if you look at what we did with Indy cars, we got about two inches of wheel travel with about three quarter inch of shock stroke. And we used a motion ratio so that we can run a smaller spring and a smaller shock. Off-road is obviously very different than IndyCar uh, or formula car, if that's what you're we're considering. Um, so I did some, some notes. The Speed UTV has 11 inches of front shock travel and 12 inches of rear shock travel. Um, we're right around that two to one ratio, not um, 1.5, I think uh, Nicholas came back and said is, is ratios ideal. Well, I'm gonna have to question the ideal ratio because with a position sensitive shock, the ideal ratio is really as it comes close to bottoming out, you wanna make sure you go to the one to one ratio at the bottom to get maximum effect of shock control. So for an example, the Unicorn or the Riviera truck or, um, or some of my other vehicles, and you can go back and you can compare it to a, I don't, I don't, uh, what do you want to call it, a geyser or a mason or whatever your flavor of the week is. Um, we are two to one uh, shock stroke for 38 inches of wheel travel on the Unicorn. So we're dancing right at that two to one number. And the back of that car works pretty good. So do a lot of the mason trophy trucks or, a, or an RPM uh, geyser truck works pretty good too. So. 1.5, mm, I don't know if that's the ideal. Uh, I think it depends on what the application may be for to, to figure out ideal. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a lot more to, as, as we're on this uh, conversation, I do wanna get back to one of Nicholas's questions. He liked the fact that the shocks are the same. So even though you see that this is an 11 inch front stroke, 12 inch total stroke, we've got 
a hydraulic droop limiter built into the shocks. Obviously, as you guys start seeing some of these things, you're gonna start, learn some of my tricks over the last 20 years. But we, we hydraulically droop limit the front to choke it up a little bit. It means it has a little more valving on the, on the D-cell. Uh, another thing that I wanted to explain to you guys, and as I click into a picture, I'm gonna go scrolling through some pictures for a minute. But we had a package thing that we had to work on. We had a packaging program that remember I wanted to give you guys a truck bed. I wanted to give every car a truck bed. Well, with that said, I had a, a height of where the top of the shock could be without poking through the truck bed because I didn't want to put holes in the bed to be able to get the shock to get to its optimum travel. So with that said, I'm going to pop over to, hmm, I might have deleted this photo. Uh, hang on a second. I, I might have deleted it today. Okay, let me go here. Um, as you see right here, um, even with our 12 inch shock, we're gonna have a little step in the UTT bed right in this area right here um, to get over the top of the shock. So, you know, on the other cars, we're, we're working really hard, but if you look at where this is and where this bar comes in, this actually integrates right to the top for structure, for chassis structure. But also we've got to make sure that we stay below the bed because last thing guys want is a couple shocks sticking through the bed. We've all seen that on the California pre-runners. Huh? Then you need wide fenders, you need wide fenders right? <laughs> all right, so uh, hopefully I answered your question here, but if you look, this chassis bar comes in here. So the UTT, as I'm onto this, I don't want to jump around. This will be the roll cage for the truck and for the open cockpit car. So um, even though the cab will be based over the top of here, this is all about chassis structure and how we load uh, the, the spine or the, uh, the structure of the chassis, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to go back over to Chupacabra questions. Sorry about that, guys. Had to jump around a little bit. I got some fun stuff coming in this presentation this week, so um, hopefully we can answer a lot of your questions and then show you why we're taking a lot of your questions into consideration when we're doing this car. I'm going to go to Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy wants to talk about bulkhead. Um, Jeremy says, how will the front diff secure to the chassis? Seems this connection uh, structurally could be a weak point. And then Toby Hawk comes back and he says, having the front diff as a main structure in the chassis front suspension is what's making it actually structurally superior. Uh, Toby, thank you for, for answering that question for me. And it actually does. If you poke around a little, you'll notice the aftermarket gusset kits, especially on a Can-Am or a Polaris, where basically you fit a front diff in and then you've got to figure out how to put a chassis structure around it. If you look at the double X, what we did there, we built a removable lower subframe that went up underneath that. Um, at the same time, why do we need to have a removable subframe if I could just make all the chassis part of the front bulkhead? So I will show you some pictures on the next page, but we are actually going to be a lot stronger structurally than all the other manufacturers in the industry. Plus we get to optimize our suspension package while optimizing the size of the front ring and pinion, gears, torque limiter, clutch, suspension geometry points. Very similar to what I've done to the Unicorn. Not a lot of you guys have seen what we got with the Unicorn here. I'm not gonna show you pictures of the Unicorn, but we have taken what we learned from the Unicorn and adapted it to the new Speed UTV. Now I'll get into bulkhead. So over here, I'll start with this, this here. Uh, you can see the, the front, but you can see the bulkhead and how it ties the suspension together. What that does is it really allows us to optimize our front suspension geometry. Uh, it, the the A-arms tie to the bulkhead. The rear pivot point of the lower rear A-arm actually holds the bulkhead, which I'll now slide over to the bulkhead. The rear pivot point holds it into a tongue and groove receiver. So have you seen tongue and groove boards before? There'll be a machined uh, inner pocket, female, that the male section of the bulkhead will plug into. Uh, so that'll keep us structurally sound left to right. There's a whole bulkhead design around the front of the car that we tie the lower pivot points in, or the lower chassis into as it comes this way. Uh, we've got V-bars coming into it. We've got another removable section up here but the pivot points and the suspension actually hold it bolted into its receiver. Then coming back from the other side, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight there, plus nine, 10 with the two um, suspension points. Now for ease of manufacturing, think about building your whole car. I can have the whole suspension bolted to the bulkhead, sitting on a bench, roll it up on a crate, plug it into the car, tighten up my lower pivot point, put a bolt on the top, snug the thing together, and I've assembled the whole front of the car. So ease of manufacturing, ease of maintenance, we have just saved the dealers a ton of time if there is warranty or crash damage. Now think about it from crash damage side. If you dive your chassis off, I mean, I've seen, I think we posted some videos before, but a guy smokes the front end, he's buying a whole chassis from Polaris or Can-Am. Here, you'll buy a new case if you did it, or you'll just adjust some of your points to get it back to where it needs to be but a lot less expensive and a lot easier for a dealer to replace this piece than it is a whole chassis and disassemble every component on your car. The amount of labor time there is astronomical crazy. So we did it for ease of manufacturing, structure, geometry, and actually to make it easier to work on. Here's another picture of the bulkhead. I'll zoom in here. The bulkhead here, you'll, you'll see a, a, a plate here there's a plate here that these vertical tubes come off the, um, let's talk about like the A-post tube will actually dive all the way down into here. Um, the radiator will actually sit up there when it's a UTT enclosed cab, but it has side structure here. It has side structure coming off these two points. It has a registered tongue in groove receiver and the steering rack is actually mounted into it. So it's all machined parts where the thing, once it's, once it's cast, pressure casted, it'll be structurally strong, but then we'll come back in and we'll hit it with the machine and do a final machine job on it. So all your suspension points will pl plug in smoothly. We don't have to worry about weld pull or, you know, hey, my suspension gets in there. And I'm sure you guys who have worked on these cars before has taken a crescent wrench and stuck it in on their suspension tab and bent it out of the way, shoved it in and over tightened it to get it back down. There will be none of that with this chassis. So hopefully I've answered your structure of the bulkhead. This has been proven. It is proven in other forms of motorsport. What I have done is I've taken things that people have done in the past and I have completely re-engineered the wheel for a four wheel drive car, not only a off-road car or a UTV, but think about a supercar. Now, if I wanna go off and build a supercar, I can do the back of an Indy car. I can do the front of the UTT or the, um, or the, um, or the speed UTVs or the trophy truck and I can adapt it. And now all I'm making is a center section carbon little cockpit and I can actually plug the bulkhead on the front, plug the motor and back on it, all the suspension bounce to it. It's a way to build a very, very light sports car, off-road car, whatever you wanna make. So this is, this is gonna evolve into the future and you'll see other products coming through our speed um, performance line as we grow in the marketplace. So hopefully this answered that question. Structurally, I'm confident it's sound. I actually can see that there's a tube coming in right here. So this is another diagonal tube to hold it left and right at the back. There's vertical tubes that come up from the top of the shock mount to the front. This thing is structurally sound and a lot stronger than anything in the industry. Uh, I thought this was kind of a cool thing and it's gonna lead us into my next conversation, which is suspension. Um, you guys are gonna look here and I, give, I have now given you full droop and full bump of the front of all three vehicles. Remember when we build a car, it's the same for a two-seater, it's the same for a UTT, it's the same for a four-seater. The reason why I wanted to show you this is I saw a really cool video from RJ and Ronnie Anderson the other day, and I thought it was a perfect opportunity to talk about cool shots, but if you look at the geometry of the car, you have to almost sit down and scratch your head and wonder who designs these cars out there and what are they thinking? So here you are, uh, as I'm in this position, I wanna explain track change. Uh, it's an optical illusion with the rear tire here, but the Speed UTV actually has optimized track change front and rear. And we've optimized it more than any UTV in the industry today. If you look here, we are bottomed out I believe we're around seven degrees of negative camber at full bump. By being at seven degrees of camber and rotating off the pivot points, that allows us to move our tire out and get wider. 
So as a Polaris jumps in the air or a Can-Am and the thing gets narrow, the speed UTV gets wider. You guys all remember those Pontiac commercials back in the day, wider is better. So down here at full droop, and I thought this was a, was a cool thing to see, you can see the rear tire gets a little bit of negative camber. That's to optimize the rear dual plunging CVs. The front tire actually has some negative camber, which means top in at full droop. Now I'm gonna slide over to my next page. And like I said, it was really cool shots, but it shows you how bad the cars really are. Here's another one bottomed out. Uh, sorry, two pages is where I had to go. Um, bottomed out, you see the negative camber. That creates stability, creates force. Tires get wider, gives you a better stance. Also gives you camber gain. So as you go to turn the steering wheel, think about it. If you turn, the car squats, gains camber, gains caster, which adds more camber again, makes the car turn better. In the rear, the same thing. The reason the speed UTVs and the Articats accelerate so good on forward acceleration compared to the other cars is we're pushing from this point right here. And if you're in a Can-Am or Polaris, you're pushing from a much higher push point. So that means you're not gonna have the amount of front drive as a speed UTV. It's gonna squat and it's gonna bite and it's gonna accelerate. So camber gain in the rear, camber gain in the front, no track change. That's the key. We focus on keeping those tires in the same position. There was a, an awesome video from somebody running a Can-Am just a couple days ago. And if you saw that thing, it was working, but it was left and right. And it was all over the place. And the track change, it, it was 10 inches. And it looked like 10 inches, it looked like a handful of drive, but it was going fast. All right, uh, now to the suspension. I felt that um, we should talk about this. Uh, it has very excessive toe change, which I was very surprised to see out of uh, top racers like these guys. Uh, I think these guys are, are excellent and I've been, you know, obviously uh, friends and family friends with them forever. I know their father, I know Walker, I know all the guys, but when you look at the suspension and you look at the positive camber change, you look at the toe, look at the toe on the front of this red car here. It has towed in drastically. Um, this means as it has drooped out, it has gotten narrow. As it gets ready to go compress, it has to really load the ball joints. When you do that, you're putting scrub into the car. It really loads all the suspension pivot points. It's not good for the geometry of the car. So I thought these were really cool shots. I thought it was a bitchin' video. I questioned the geometry of these Polarises. A lot of stability, a lot of, a lot of car um, hunt, something you can't control. You're always chasing the track change. You're always chasing the car moving. From my experience, you want the tires to stay in the tire path all the time. You don't want any scrub. You don't want any of that stuff. And that's why we've designed the Speed UTV the way we have done it. So I thought this was good. I thought I should show you this. I'm going to back up two pages, full droop. I know it's a CAD. People are gonna say, oh, you'll just adjust your camber in the CAD. That's not true. This is what it cycles out. This is what the original cars cycle out. This is where we're at suspension wise. And this is why we have done it. Shows you it keeps the tires in the road. So the track change is a lot less on a speed UTV. Uh, I wanted to give you some revised dashes. Uh, we continue to work every week. We're listening to comments, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? I'll zoom into each one. Uh, this is an RPM page. You'll click this mode button right here. This will tell you where you're at with your tire pressures. It'll tell you where you're at on your climb, engine oil temperature, speed, what gear you're in. Uh, this is another mode over here. Click that button, gives you RPM, gives you your mile per hour, gives you park, gives you a bunch of your other accessories. Uh, the guys are doing a wonderful job on the dashes. We're getting excited about where we're at here. Uh, more screen, um, screen mirroring pages. Uh, obviously, we are going to have screen mirroring on our car. We will screen mirror from the phone. So if you've got an app where you can go and you know, look at your trails, lead nav, something like that, bam, you've got all your courses all over. Um, diff lock tells you when you're in diff lock, when you're not. We'll have you know, idle RPM, a bunch of different things. And then obviously when you go landscape, is that landscape, is that what I'm saying right? 
when I go landscape, it gets uh, wider and your screen could get better. And we're also working on a full screen of just map that if you have an alarm come up, it would take over your map and start blocking different sections of where your, where your problem area is. You have to hit this mode button. So you'll have to reach up here and click that mode button. You'll have to program your, um, your app or your screen mirroring before you drive. Uh, obviously, you won't, once you're moving, you will not be able to adjust that. Uh, I want to get back to a couple more questions. Um, Thomas Upshaw, so for the pre-order vehicles, if we do not get the speed key when we buy it and wait until the warranty expires, we'll be able to get the speed key for a dollar since we bought cars in a pre-order, or will it be $2,500? I'm gonna double answer your question. If you buy a car before November, November of 2020, your speed key is a dollar. So you buy a car before November, your speed key is a dollar. If you don't activate your speed key, and we're, we're thinking it's gonna be a dongle now, that we give you a dongle, you plug it in, we know when you activate it, you know when you activate it, but at the same time, you can adjust when you wanna do it. So if you wanna ride on our warranty, and you wanna be conservative out there, uh, I, I think it's a smart thing to do, I would wait. But then again, you might be a racer, like, like Casey over here, and he might have to try to beat me and plug in his dongle a little bit early before the warranty's up. All right, Mike um, answered the question. I think you get the key um, so they don't have to warranty the vehicle. Uh, if it was me, I'd leave it stock. This is your guys' choice, all right? My job is to give you options of the best vehicle in the industry, and it's your choice to use it when you want to use it. Um, but that is not to get out of warranty. Um, this, this speed key is going to be a wake-up call for a lot of people in the industry. Um, you're going to want to remove it if you're going to let your kids and wife and other people drive the vehicle. It's going to be a violent machine. It's going to be a lot of fun. But then again, you can go buy a Corvette today. You can walk down the dealer and buy a Corvette and get all kinds of fun for 700 horsepower. Uh, so why not? Uh, if I was to get one, Thomas comes back. If I get one, so Thomas obviously has not bought a car. This is a guy just uh, keyboard warrior in here asking questions. Uh, I'll look up Thomas and see if he bought a car at the end of this. I should have done it before. Um, he said he would instead put the $2,500 into upgrades. Whatever you choose. I mean, you might want window nets. You might want, you know, um, intercom radio. You can do what you want. But you don't get to put your $2,500 of the speed key wherever you want. You have a choice. If you buy a car, you get the speed key. When you tell us you want it, we send it to you. You want to use it before warranty, great. You want to use it after warranty, no problem. That's your choice as well. Um, so yes, Chris comes back and says, and I really, I like you guys going back and forth and, and teaching everybody what I'm saying and I'll, I'll stay consistent. Uh, and if I make a mistake, please call me out and I will come back and answer it properly if I said something wrong. Um, said that I said the speed key purchase any time for LE customers. Yes, if you buy a car, an LE car from now until November, so you buy an LE car from now until November, you get your speed key for $1. All right, that's an LE or an RG edition car. So if you buy an RG edition car, which is a step above the LE, you also get that speed key for a dollar before November. After November, it's going to be $2,500 for the speed key. So buy a car now. One dollar upgrade for pre-order cars, 2,500 once it's done. All tunes will be CARB EB, EPA compliant. Um, speed key is going to require a liability release and voids warranty. I've said it, I'm saying it again. Uh, happen to sell your car to a different purchaser, the one dollar price is void. Um, if you sell your car to a different purchaser, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting, um, yeah, I guess if you sold your car, plugged, plugged your speed key in, um, then the one dollar would be, would be void, you'd void your warranty. If you, once you plug it in, you void your warranty. And back again, 
uh, can be purchased for a dollar anytime pre-order customers after you buy the car? Yes. So you have up to six months. We know who you pre-order guys are and girls. We appreciate your business, appreciate your support. And yes, you can put that in, buy it, request it to be sent to you. It will be coded for your ECU. You will not be able to trade speed keys between cars. So it'll be a, a coded dongle that you will get. Martin asked, um, Martin made me go to work today. Actually, he made Casey and Max go to work. I wanna be honest with you. Martin, I appreciate your question. Is the front and rear differentials gonna be the same ratio? The XX front overdrives the rear and makes the car drive like it's on rails in the desert and sand washes. Actually, the XX, from what we see, it's about straight up. We did 10 rotations, we marked the tires, we locked the front diffs, we picked it up with a forklift and drug it around. So it has the same ratio, front to rear, our car will have the same ratio as well. It's, it's the same to the fourth decimal point? Okay, so, so Daniel's telling me on the computer calculations, it's the same all the way to the fourth decimal point. So it is the same. Now, one thing about the speed UTV between the double X and speed UTV is we will have a clutchable front drive shaft that is set as a torque limiter. So if you saw a spike front to rear, it will actually slip that clutch. We will be tuning that clutch to make sure it does spike so that it relieves the CVs and, and large shocks, okay? Now, if you think you can buy this car and go out there and just hammer it wide open like a maniac, remember, we're gonna know everything you guys do with this car and when it's on the throttle, when it's not on the throttle, et cetera, because we do have warranty, we do have some of the best ECUs in the business, and we will know when speed key's plugged in, when it's unplugged, what fuel you're running, when the knock sensors kick on. We've got a lot of data that we will be able to monitor off these cars. So gear ratios are the same front to rear on the double X, and they're the same on the speed UTV, but the double X does drive awesome. It handles the corners really well, and it drives like it's on rails when it's in four wheel drive. Bruce asked the question, uh, what's the spec of the tube at the rear trailing arm is mounts to? Must be heavy duty support for the load or of the double pivot point trailing arms without radius arms to support it. Tabs have weld washers, any adjustment? All right, so Bruce, I, I appreciate your question today. You know, the, this five link suspension was designed originally because they couldn't figure out how to make the CV joints work to plunge. All right, that's the truth to the whole thing. So the five link was designed to get around uh, CV plunge. What I did was design a CV that was reliable and that can plunge. And if you ask anybody that has bought a speed UTV axle for their double X, they'll tell you the thing is virtually bulletproof, okay? Uh, we've had really, really, really good su uh, success with our dual plunging axles. The last thing I would want is radius rods on a car. If you look at what the geometry loads and how it jacks the chassis up when you get into a corner, it's a horrible design. If you look at any, any fast car out there that has trailing arms on it, there's no five link cars that run with them. I'm sorry, they don't exist. So back to your question, I wanted to get a little deeper into your question. And as we get farther with the renders, you see that we, we've got our engine in place here. With the turbo, we've got the rear diff open, so you can't see the covers on it, but you can see the ring and pinion. You can see one there, you can see the exhaust, how it runs. But I wanted to point something out here. In our chassis model, this tube here is 120 wall. All right, so I want to make sure you guys understood that was 120. These pivot points here are forged. That's a forged pivot point that welds onto the, the uh, tube there. It's coped, it supports it really well, it dissipates the load but it's more than the tube structure. If you look here, we've got another triangle. If you look at bridges, we've talked about chassis design over the last two months now that we've been uh, doing these videos, and you can see that the chassis has a triangle here which makes us very, very strong. Trailing arm, pivoting from here is very good. The adjuster down here, I wanna make sure everybody understands what we're adjusting with this. This is not to adjust your toe. This is to adjust the axle, all right? So what we're doing here with this pivot point is to control your axle at full, uh, let's say um, mid-travel, which it's in its shortest distance, and at full droop, which it's in its longest distance. And we're managing how much axle plunge we have with that rod in. So we will do a very good explanation, 
not only for the dealers that have been working on the double X's, I think we've got one of the best axle tools in the industry to set them up. Customers that have bought our, our axle tool, it's very simple. There's other ones out there that other guys make that honestly don't make any sense. Whoever designed them, they need to probably get shot because they're, they're forgetting about all chassis welds, okay? If, if you weld this chassis and the whole thing structurally moves, the only point you're worried about is the difference between the CV joint and CV joint. So you can adjust your axle tune, not your toe. So this is the bottom of the car, as we talked about. Has another cool feature, I'll slide over to the front. You can now see this a little bit better. Front bulkhead optimizes pivot points, gets us as close as we can to the ring and pinion, gets the longest axles that we can possibly get into the diff, all aluminum structure that fits in a tongue and groove receiver right here. There's gonna be a few more pieces added to here, but trust me, it'll be plenty strong for you guys. Um, UTT is starting to come along. We've got a, a couple more body shots. You can now see last week we showed you with the door out. Now we're showing you with the panel um, getting morphed in there. It's starting to come together. 110 inch wheelbase. As we talked about earlier, this chassis tube comes down, supports the shock, okay? So this is here for a reason. Uh, if you look at the cab, it's got a little bit of a raised cab slope back. That is to make the roof of the Speed UTV look better. So we've had to make some adjustments. You know, we've been showing you this stuff for the last seven weeks. As of today, this is something I'm, I'm actually kind of in shock, but very proud of. Um, we have sold 766 pre-order cars. That's shocking. Um, I knew you guys had confidence in what we do. I want to thank you for believing in us and being part of our program. And uh, it, it's amazing. 619 four-seaters. I remember somebody telling me not too long ago that a four-seater won't sell. There's not a market for it. God, I love this. I can't make me smile anymore because uh, we're going to have our day where we can show you that four-seaters are the most sold vehicle we have in our company. LEs, uh, Polaris told me four-seaters wouldn't sell either, so I will say that. Um, I built the four-seat Polaris when Max was born, so that's where the four-seater Polaris started. LE pricing. Uh, changes on Monday, June 1st. Told you guys I wanted to give you a fair notice. I didn't want to just shut it off. Uh, I've talked to the factory. They've agreed to build more cars before November so we can meet delivery deadlines. Uh, we will keep LE pricing till June 1st. Uh, the LE four-seater today is still $32,000. It will go up to $35,000 on December 1st. So as soon as we launch, June 1st to December 1st, it will be $35,000. Come once we have dealers. We gotta have dealer margin in these cars. Once we have a dealer margin, that same car will be $37,000 sitting on the dealer floor. Then you're gonna say, oh man, that's gonna be $5,000 more than a Polaris or Can-Am. When you look at these two cars next to it, 5,000 will seem cheap. Will I have a diff? So you want to cover up this beautiful aluminum work? Um, question was, will I have a skid plate under the front diff aluminum work? The answer is yes. It will have a full front skid that will protect the steering. I'm just showing you the open raw components. But yes, it will have a skid that will start right below the front valence, and it will go a full skid all the way under the car. So we will give you a full skid front to rear on the car. We will give you your bump rubber under the rear diff as a factory unit on all cars. So some of the things we've learned over the last five years, we will give you a lot of these upgrades on these cars. Uh, I wanna get back into dealer pricing a little bit. I do wanna talk about bolts because I had someone ask me about bolts and I think I forgot to put it in the slide, but it's, it's okay, we'll get to it. Dealer pricing base car will always stay 32,000. Um, base car does not come with a roof, comes with plastic seats, comes with non beadlock wheels. Virtually the same thing, just missing a bunch of very cool accessories. Uh, limited car, once it hits to dealers in December, will be 37, and the RG edition, which will be the hot rod of the UTV industry, that'll be $39,000. Um, base car, um, 
is still be available includes plastic seats like the competitors, no roof, basic graphics, and uh, the non beadlock wheel. Uh, we're back bottomed out. I want to show uh, what are the accessories, what is the value people are getting, and we've got to be careful how we say this. So $5,900 in value is what we're giving you um, for being a valuable customer in the beginning as we launch this product. Um, Obviously, there's a little bit less value in the UTT because it's missing the back seats. We've taken that into consideration with our pricing as well. But you'll be two less carbon seats, two less five-point harnesses. You'll still get your roof. So roof, which you don't see in this picture, will be on it. will be a UHMW roof. It'll be a five-point harness. It'll be a custom wrap. You will get to choose your graphic on this car. So you're going to get to choose your graphic. My goal is in the next couple of weeks, we've got graphics. You can start clicking your colors, seeing what your speed UTV is really going to look like at your choice. Something very different than what anybody else is doing in the industry today. Uh, we will install the wrap for you. You will get our cool carbon fiber seats. Uh, you won't get this headrest seat, but you will get one of these very nice uh, carbon fiber seats. And um, total value is $5,900 we talked about. LE and RG, perfect. I will answer the difference. An RG is basically a pre-runner. So uh, the difference between the LE and the RG will be window nets, radio. Uh, do we have it? Uh, yeah, there it is. Oh, I'm on the page, sorry. Didn't even realize I did it. I flicked over the RG page. It gets all LE upgrades. It gets a window net package. People say, man, that's $1,800 for window nets. Well, if you think about it, our standard double X windows are $899, and that's for two. This is a four-door, so you've got to double that, okay? So $1,800 is window net, um, and intercom and radio is $1,300. You will get powder-coated roll cage. You'll get powder-coated suspension, and obviously, you'll get your custom rack. So that one's going to have over $10,000 in upgrade value. So the RG edition, uh, you will get value for it. Um, there will be a discount for buying one, but it will be $39,000 uh, once it hits the dealers, okay? And people upgrade their LE pre-order to an RG? Yes, I will allow you to upgrade from an LE to an RG. You still have time to do that. We will allow you guys to transfer from a two-seater to a UTT to a four-seater. Um, whatever you guys want to do in the next, uh, let's say the next four months, you guys have at it. Think about what car fits you best. Think about what option package, but you guys are one of our first uh, customers and I appreciate it. I, I, I honestly appreciate it. It's, uh, it's actually scary to think about that we're gonna sell 1,500 cars before we deliver cars in November. All right, 1,500 cars. That's an awesome launch. Can we add the radios from the factory? Uh, can you add the radios from the factory? We will add the radio from the factory. So if you go to the RG edition, you will get radio, you will get intercom. If you do it at a later time, I will make sure that I do the install as easy as it is on the XX. I think I did it at Sand Sports a couple years ago. I think it took me four minutes to totally install the radio and intercom into the vehicle. It will be the same thing on the Speed UTV. It'll be a pre-wired package, plug it in, the wire will already be there. You'll run your antenna wire, flick your key on, you've got radio and intercom. So uh, my goal is to make sure that you can spend less time working on your car and more time driving your car and having fun. What's the upgrade price from an LE to an RG that they already have a If you have an uh, uh, LE to RG, uh, I will post that price next week. Next, um, next Wednesday night, I'll give you all RG pricing. Hopefully I can get some graphic rendering, some window nets, show you what I believe an RG car should look like. If you scroll over here, it'll be very similar to what our race graphics look like. It'll be the carbon wrap with the orange, orange suspension, orange roll cage, uh, radio intercom, some really cool parts. Somebody asked, they saw the powder coat. Um, what is the LE going to be? LE is going to be black. So um, the suspension, I'll go back and forth. It'll either be like a charcoal gray suspension with a black a roll cage. Uh, so LEs will be charcoal gray and uh, like you've seen the people that have seen my trophy truck over the years the uh, the lower um, lower suspension some somewhat of a metallic charcoal with um, with black roll cage black uh, chassis
you do get to pick your graphics, so you can pick purple if you choose. Uh, you can pick orange. You can mix. You can mix. Unicorn gray. You can pick unicorn gray. I will make sure that you can pick unicorn gray. Uh, I loved the unicorn gray. That was an old NASCAR primer that we used to do when we went to Daytona and Talladega testing. And let me tell you, when we put that on the unicorn with a little bit of graphics. It was very cool looking at Parker. All right, Ellie. Um, I got some UTT. Um, yep, UTT today, thirty thousand dollars. UTT from now until December 1st. So if you buy a UTT from now until December 31st, you get the LE. All right, so I answered that question on the next page. The LE will go to $33,000 in December as we launch to dealers. The base, will, we will do our best to stay. We're going to stay, not do our best. We will stay at $30,000 as a base unit on the speed UTT as well. So. I'm going to say an RG UTT is probably going to be $35,000. Um, dealer pricing, boom, there it is, $35,000. Um, so dealer pricing is here, base car limited. Uh, limited. Right now, if you buy a car before December, you get the limited. You get the carbon seats, you get the seat belts, you get the roof. Um, base car will be 30, RG edition will be 35. There's another view of the the UTT, this is the proper wheelbase for a race car. This is what we had at Dakar two years ago. It's what I would build. That's what we're gonna race on the desert. The UTT is gonna be a monster. It's gonna be hard to compete with this car in the desert. I wanna break for just a second and I wanna talk about suspension pivots. There was a guy asked a question back here uh, about four pages ago, right there. Um, and I wanna talk about the double pivot uh, trailing arms and the load on the bolts. So I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect my, uh, would you grab me um, some bolts, Casey? I'm gonna bring some bolts over here where I can explain to you our bolt. I'm gonna need a Sharpie too if anybody has one. Um, but I wanna explain what we've done and what the factory has agreed to do for us on the Speed UTT. Thank you, appreciate that Kyle. Casey's bringing over a few bolts. Um, can I get a three quarter inch wrench out of the, um, out of the drawer? Um, what we've done is we've chosen the bolt head size to be three quarter. One thing nice about a three quarter, can I get a 19 also? 19 and three quarter, virtually the same. I've got some speed bolts here in my hand. Uh, can we move our cameras? Is that gonna be a problem? All right, cool, he'll bring it to me and we'll, we'll just tilt down. Um, I wanted to explain the, uh, the speed bolts. We put a lot of time and consideration into the bolt technology of our vehicles. It's something I learned at a very young age from my father, he taught me. And I'm sure a lot of the people in the, in the off-road world have bought bolts, took them over to the bandsaw, cut them off, go over to the grinding disc, roll them around a little bit, and, um, and have used these things to, to get basically shear pins um, but we've taken the shear pin program to the next level and i'm gonna leave my cabinet over here and i want to walk up and i want to show you but these are the speed bolts that we made originally um, you know for for some of our off-road cars and we've adapted them over to the the race dakar cars but this bolt i'm going to take and go ahead i'm going to put a sharpie line right here uh, it's bottomed out so right here, the, the nut is bottomed out and the bolt is here. This is something pretty cool that, um, that we went out and we, we pulled some patents on. Uh, something I've never seen in my um, 35 years of motorsport experience. But the nut, when you're looking at the bolt, I'm gonna leave it over here at this side. I'm gonna spin the nut loose and I'm gonna go ahead and put a, a mark on the nut so you guys can count this with me. There's a star on the nut there. But as this turns, one turn, still shoulder, two turns, still shoulder, three turns, still shoulder. So that means in this area right here, I've got about 250 thou of pin location. 
when you tighten this thing down and it registers into the custom made speed nut, it puts the pivot points into a shear pin. A lot of people have worked with tractors and seen how they use shear pins all over the place. We've actually adjusted the bolt to ride over the shoulder right here, if you look, 250 thou to turn it into a shear pin. Anybody that buys a speed UTV, you're gonna get proper suspension bolts finally on your car. What this also does is if you think about it, I'll unthread the nut one more time and try to explain it. If your bolt does not go all the way through your pivot, so if you have bolts like a Can-Am or a Polaris or a Honda or a Yamaha, and the bolts don't go all the way through your suspension, you're riding on the threads. Well, when you ride on the threads, you're basically riding on the surface area. Instead of riding on a smooth shoulder that gives you a lot of strength, you ride on the threads. What happens when you ride on threads? Click, 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 wallers out all your brackets. So he talks about weld washers. We took weld washer to a completely different game. So speed bolts will come on the speed UTV on all suspension pivot points, all steering pivot points, all shock mounts, all brake calipers, anything that gets shear loaded, it'll come with speed bolts. So that's another accessory. When we said we were building the best UTV in the industry, we've taken it all the way down to the nut and the bolts. I'll get back to the presentation. Uh, oh, I, I did want to show one other thing. It doesn't matter what size bolt it is. It doesn't matter if it's a small one for like a steering or a big one for a suspension. They all take the same wrenches. So except for the largest pivot point, but everything you need, the two wrenches you need on your car, you need a 19 or a three quarter to work on all your suspension, including your tie rods, your suspension. The only nut that doesn't is that inner pivot bolt that he was talking about. This one here, 21? I think it goes seven to eights. seven eighths, 21, right? I believe it's another um, metric standard conversion where you can mix and match your tools. All right, I think 22, seven eighths? 21 or 22, sorry, I don't know it by heart. Uh, I'm still, I work with, with American wrenches, so I get a little confused with the metric stuff, but we did try to make sure that you can use the same wrenches, um, which are pretty much in everybody's toolbox. And the correct answer is 22. So the inner pivot point uses a three corner on the head side because it has a bigger bolt with a bigger load, which Bruce was asking about. Uh, it does get to the, um, the 22 millimeter, which is also a seven eighths. All right, uh, let's click back. All right, I guess that's the, the end of the presentation. I will leave this week's presentation on this page right here. Give you guys something to think about. Awesome video, very cool landscape. They must have spent a lot of time um, building the track. But man, when I saw the cars, I... back to the drawing board. How uh, pre-orders will take delivery? Pre-orders? How will? How will they get delivered? Uh, we are working on an awesome delivery program with our pre-orders. Um, stay tuned the next couple weeks. Uh, we've got a lot planned, a lot of fun stuff. But I think uh, Todd Romano, um, has. this is one that falls under his category. He wants to do delivery parties. Gatherings, people meet people, learn people to ride with. Um, once we get out of the social distance and hopefully people wanna go, go riding with, uh, with fellow speed UTV buyers. So we've got a plan for that as well. I thank you for tuning in this week. We'll be back next Wednesday night, same time. Hopefully this works a little bit better for West Coast. Have a good night. Stay safe.